Last month, we released part one of an interview with Dr. Conrad Cording, who runs the K-Lab at UPenn, where we talked about uncertainty in the brain. Coming up is a continuation of that conversation. This is Numenta Community Manager Matt Taylor. So you mentioned motor output or motor motor representation in the visual cortex. So let me talk. Let's talk about that a little bit. Why do you think motor output is produced across the entire neocortex? Why is there motor everywhere? So, so I mean, like this. Of course, the motor chauvinism argument. Now, why do you have a brain? To move better. That's the only reason why you have a brain. <laughs> like, what about the what about the visual areas? What about the you know the visual areas? areas that are that just to move effect. better. Just everywhere, everywhere. It's like so. So does it feel like your whole brain is is like basically modeling your whole body constantly, all at the same time in the space around it? I mean, it has to be, right? <laughs> well, uh, yeah. I don't. I don't know, but like. Uh, you, you can make a pretty clean argument that movement is what things are about. No? The only way how you affect your evolutionary success is to somehow sending the right commands to the right muscles at the right time. Even speech is ultimately a movement act. And yeah. suddenly a lot of the way of, of the way people think is built on sockets that were more simple movement sockets. Have you seen, uh, so I saw this x-ray recently of a mouth like uh, with an MRI or something while it was talking and the complicated movements of uh, inside your mouth is ridiculous. It's like, it's like a gymnastic feat. It's amazing. It's, 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 it's off the chart. But then if you think about it, if you do sports, you might spend an hour every day or if you're a world-class athlete, you might spend several hours every day right. training. Right. In that sense, all of us are world-class athletes at speaking. Yes. <laughs> now you spend hours every day talking to your friends. We started <laughs> learning as soon as we started making noise, you know. <laughs> that's, that's, that's right. So we have tens of thousands of hours of experience moving that tongue in our mouth. And the way we speak makes a huge difference right. And that's on how people perceive us. It, it, it truly is important. So when, sure, we are good at it. When you think about it from that way, we're much further from real language understanding than than we think, you know, because I feel like I'm on the same page with you. Motor, I think, is essential. The, the motor aspect, the integration with reality, with your motor commands. And that's so crucial to language as we've learned it. I mean, because that's the only way we know how language exists is, is through movement and feedback with other people we're communicating with. This is this, this right, yeah. And how they perceive us and how we share ideas. Right. Now, like so, Some of the most amazing things that people do is they have shared intentionality. Now, like you want to understand intelligence, I want to understand intelligence. Like at some level, what makes life as scientists so enjoyable is that we share that. Right, it's the social interact. It's brains, <coughs> brains with and brains. The collection of brains, you know, that really make us human. I think. Yeah, yeah. it's it's a crucial aspect of what makes us us. That's great. Uh, okay, so I got another topic. It's a technical topic. Um, it's from one of your papers about. Um, well, you call it. I like to use the phrase time warping, but. Um, maybe you can explain uh, the the phenomenon I'm talking about in the brain. You know, when a monkey, for example, reaches or does something or does a task, and and how the neurons involved in in that task, at least observed in that task, don't necessarily happen when the reach happens. Why is that? So so it, it, it's it's really interesting if we start at the other end. Great. So let's say you see something. I show you a flash of light and I ask you, push the button as soon as you see the flash of light. Right. Okay, so it takes a little bit for the information to make it from your eye to your higher order brain areas. Right. What is interesting is how long it takes for it to make it cross your eyes depends on how bright it is. If I give you a super bright flash, it's kind of going to make it to your retina faster than if it's a dim light. I can so, see that, yeah. So what that means is that the processing that's going to happen in your visual cortex 
will be faster for the bright things and slower for the not so bright things. Now, that introduces that, that basically there's not, you aren't time locked to the outside world. Sometimes you're faster, sometimes you're slow, and it depends on things like brightness. Now, we can make it more complicated. There's like this famous drawing where you have an elephant, but the legs aren't right. So it's clearly not an elephant. Mm -hmm. So if you're in that situation, it takes you a while to pass that image. And sometimes some people have that Eureka, oh my God, that doesn't even work, those legs element like, very quickly and some of them have it very slowly and how fast or slow you have it depends on the situation so now what that means is that the inside of your brain isn't locked in time to the outside there's like random time delays happening sometimes things go faster sometimes things go slower right this is a huge problem for the way we analyze brains because because what we do typically is we give a stimulus and we measure the neural activity that happens after the stimulus. But what if sometimes the neural activity is early and sometimes it's late? Well, it means that it's all going to be washed out in a way. You mean later than normal or just that, like yeah. it's not always perfectly after? Yeah, the let's, let's, let's say, let, let's, let's take the easiest case. Let's say we have a brain cell. It shows me after some delay, a little spike when it sees something. Sure. Now, it means that if sometimes, let's take it only the brightness. Say, but sometimes it's 20 milliseconds earlier. Sometimes it's 20 milliseconds later. So at that point of time, if I ask what the average activity is of the neuron, it will be totally washed out. That spike will sometimes be early, sometimes it will be late. Right. So it will look like this is a very boring, very sluggish, very smooth cell where maybe what it does is something like it says like, yes, now I just saw it. Yeah, yeah. It's okay. actually very precisely timed, but you're it not. It could seeing... be incredibly precisely timed relative to when you actually see it. Uh -huh. But very but it, specifically to the context or something, you know, is that? That's right, exactly. It could be really complicated. And what that means is if we analyze the data as we do at the moment, it will look like the whole brain is boring. Everything's kind of low pass. Nothing much happens there. Right. Well, it contains that in one trial where you see it early and in another trial you see it late and then you can't even say which cell is earlier or later because, well, they will, maybe you recognize both of them sometimes early, both of them later at a later point of time. Right. So the interpretation then gets to be difficult. Now, I think this is much more problematic even on the movement side. When I ask you to say, plan to touch the tip of your nose with your hand. Well, sometimes you might do it like just in time for the movement, or sometimes you might do it now and like, keep talking with Conrad and then you execute it. And what that means is that there's no alignment of the outside world with what's in the brain. But everything we do in neural data analysis, or most things that we do, is based on the assumption that it's locked to the outside world. Right, right. Okay, so now time warping is like a technical set of algorithms to kind of undo those kinds of problems. It's a, but, it's a data processing function, right, to help it, identify that. Exactly. It's like the way we use it is if you give me lots of neurons and I want to ask the question, well, uh, how fast are they like jointly stepping through that process that they normally do? Right. And it, allow, it basically allows that on some, at some times it might be earlier, sometimes it might be later. But, but this is a universal thing, you know, like your brain is not time locked to the outside world. And once you realize that anything you analyze in neural responses is getting much more complicated. Right. Yeah, that, that makes sense. I mean, there's certain experiences you have that seem very slow and others that seem very fast. And there's some evidence that has to do with, you know, the balances of chemicals in your brain and stuff like that. I mean, and, a lot of and context the, for computation in your brain. Right, in the temperature. If I heat up your brain a little bit, the wave, no the volley of spikes might go okay, go through it a little faster. Oh, yeah. like a little bit, like you can just do it, get warmly dressed, uh, run really hot in the sunshine. 
All right. Well, Same next thing. time I take an exam, I'll dress very warm. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, OK, uh, Dr. Cording, uh, a couple more questions from our forum. Uh, we have a couple, almost a couple thousand people on our HTM forum. And um, I sort of let them know sometimes who I'm going to who I'm going to talk to. And uh, some a couple of questions I'll give you from the forum. Um, somebody read your research page and said that they quoted the page saying that you sort of have these two angles and and one is and, and this is for uh, addressing information processing in the nervous system. One angle is analyzing and explaining electrophysical data and, and you study what neurons do and the other being analyzing and explaining human behavior, which is studying what all those neurons do together. And I thought this was an interesting. His question is, how do you begin to model that huge gap? You know, those are, those seem like they're going in two different directions. Um, so he'd like to hear you talk about that. Yeah, so this is a huge problem. That there is this huge gap between basically behavior, which is complicated, includes billions of neurons, and what an individual neuron does. And I'm not sure how to cross that gulf. In fact, like I've written a couple of papers where it kind of like voiced the worries that I have about that. So when we make that bridge in neuroscience, we are often very imprecise. Say we, we take some brain area, we find that there's some neurons that do something, and then we say, oh yeah, therefore that part of the brain solves the face recognition problem. Right, right. And that logic doesn't work out like that. It's basically Finding that there's a difference, if I show a different face, doesn't mean that these cells don't do other things. And the correlation with faces doesn't mean which role it has in communication. Now, like for all that I know, if I give you a task where you press your right finger, when you see a face, that uh, that like muscle has a really strong correlation with there being a face. And right. yet arguing that your muscle processes faces is perfectly pointless. Right. Um, and so, yes, there is that huge gulf between those two views. And it's a little unclear how to, how to bridge it. And you might argue that it's, it, it could be impossible to naively bridge the gap. And let, let me kind of make the point on how it could be impossible. So it could be that the way how all the neurons interact, when say, I look at you and I like phrase a sentence, that that way is of such a complicated nature that people could never learn it. And the analogy that I want to use here is like deep learning systems. Let's say you take ImageNet, um, a big data set of images that are labeled. And we have like since AlexNet, we have like good deep learning systems that can solve that. Yeah. Um, they aren't very good because I have an um, Amazon Alexa here who just decided to turn itself on when I used its uh, <laughs> when I used its name. Um, it happens so, to me all the time. <laughs> so 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 basically, if the brain is something like a neural network, which which means that it optimizes its properties, it has plasticity, it adapts to the outside world, then at some level the way how your brain operates is as complicated as the world in which it is. So you can't properly describe my brain unless you also describe how dinosaurs work. <laughs> no? this so, is, yeah. This, so, this so, is so, a so the problem is like anything. <laughs> uh, that's right. I, I try to bring in an example of a dinosaur in anything that I say. So, yeah. so basically, any reflection of the thing, anything that I know must be reflected in a satisfactory model of Conrad, no? Mm. Which means there cannot be a compact model of Conrad because Conrad knows stuff about dinosaurs. So if you cannot compress a model of Conrad, then in a way we can't produce something that is both a workable model of Conrad and can be understood. Perhaps, however, my counter would be, I mean, a model that has learned how to be Conrad, I would say absolutely, you're right. But there's also the substrate in which that model learned reality. That's, uh, that's, 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 that's right, and I agree with you that at some level, maybe the reason why the gulf is so big is because behavior, as, as people exhibit, kind of contains all those things that we learn from, from the world, and rightfully yeah. so. 
That's absolutely right, yeah. And if it contains all those things, then maybe we are barking up the wrong tree. Maybe what we should rather say is, okay, what is the substrate? What is the learning algorithm? What are the cost functions that the brain may be optimizing? Is it using an optimization algorithm? Those questions then become very central. Whereas the question of kind of like, how does it work at the, at the, at the low level? Like, okay, how do neurons contribute to behavior might be the wrong question. You know, like the fact that like somewhere in Conrad's early visual cortex, neurons have GABA wavelet, that mm -hmm. might not be meaningfully part of a description of how Conrad works. Right, it's so hard to decide what to study and what is contributing to the overall model. <laughs> yeah, so, so in that sense, my answer to that gulf is the gulf might be of the nature that we need to rethink what we want to study on both sides. Maybe the way we study behavior isn't quite right. Maybe the way we study neurons isn't quite right. But how those two can come together, that is something that people tend to expect that someone else will solve it. <laughs> right. <laughs> Well, I'm I'm hopeful in in neuroscience right now because as, I don't know uh, how much you know about what we're doing at Nementa, but we're really excited about grid cells. Uh, and we've incorporated it into our neocortical theory. You know, that knowing that I've talked about grid cells a lot in other interviews, so I don't think I need to like give a basic description of what grid cells are, and I, I'm sure you know what they are. Uh, okay, okay, but but look, here's here's the problem. So great cells, you refer to the tuning of cells. You refer to tuning cells that basically as you keep walking in some direction, like periodically like go up and down in the activity. Maybe this is something that characterizes the specific environment in which rodents are raised, where like that kind of representation is useful. If right. you had different mice, it might be totally different or different humans. Right. So the question is to which level are tuning of neurons really the right level to reason about intelligence because the problem with tuning like like great cells is that it reflects the experience in our world Absolutely. and therefore that it might be hugely dependent on the world in which you grow up and that makes total sense even in the grid cell community right now because there's still questions about do rats create a two-dimensional representation of space is that as the grid cells they're creating only two-dimensional versus other animals that move through 3d space are they fundamentally different in the way that they right and what if you gave mice like little flying things with which they could move through 3d space well we know the brain is so plastic and malleable who knows i mean you just don't know but i definitely agree with you like my grid cells that work in my brain were built off of my experience with the world and i don't think that they would work with it for anybody else, you know, or maybe for any other species for sure. I mean, there could be some um, some things that are the same within species. I don't know. I'm getting way out of my league here, but but the way everyone interacts with reality and has a specific specific what I like to call um, uh, I, I always go to uh, Max Tegmark because he described these different layers of reality there's an internal reality that everyone has that is unable to be shared i cannot share my what i read is to me with you except through a consensus reality which is language to where we've both labeled these things and we have symbols to represent them and we can understand them and then there's actual reality which we all try and understand as best we can and communicate about with consensus reality and uh yeah this whole idea is that my internal reality the, are, the grid cells that i have are a part of that the grid cells a mouse has are a part of its internal reality so it's really hard to differentiate what those mean to them versus us versus that right exactly so so that's just why i'm like worried a bit like which role findings like grid cells should have in the way we conceptualize intelligence right <laughs> and that's a uh, that's an open question so, so but, in, but in this sense, to come back to the question that was asked, it's, it's like how to bridge that gap? I don't know. And I'm pretty convinced that right at this moment, very, very few people have thought hard about it. It's, it's, it's a huge gap and it's a yeah. gap that we need to acknowledge that we don't know the solutions. If we pretend that we do them, we will misguide people. The dangers of this gap is that there's, it's so big, I think, there's so many crazy ideas between one and the other. 
that it's really hard to differentiate between whose idea is crazy versus whose is brilliant. I mean, in this space, <laughs> it's hard to say sometimes. Uh, no one knows exactly. I know. Oh. So um, anyway, uh, Dr. Cording, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Uh, thanks a lot for taking your time and giving it to us and our community. Um, it's been really great. So uh, is there anything that you have a soapbox on that you want to talk about while you have this opportunity? Absolutely. I want to talk about causality. Okay, so, great. <laughs> so I think a lot of the language that we want to use when we talk about brains is causal language. We want to ask how neurons make things happen, how brain areas make things happen, or how neuromodulators might make learning happen. Those are all causal questions. We know how, like, we want to know how one thing makes another thing happen. When you look at the bulk of the approaches in neuroscience, they're correlational findings. You know? I show you a face and I see what the activity in your brain is. And those two are very different statements. So correlations are, are not really indicative about underlying causality. Mm -hmm. And I want to encourage everyone who wants to think about intelligence to start thinking about causality. The, the, the problem we solve in the world is understand the causal chains in the world. We don't care what's correlated. We care about which things we could do to the world to make the world more pleasant for us. Right. Um, and we, we, in same thing as scientists, we fundamentally care about causality, which things make which other things happen. And it's just so easy to measure correlations. And I believe that uh, large parts of the community, therefore, effectively start equating the two of them. And that's something that we should avoid. That's a good point. Uh, what do you think uh, uh, companies like us that are trying to work in this space can do, can benefit from that type of uh, perspective? So I think for a company like Numenta, if you want to, I mean, like ultimately, what do you build into your models? Is a causal chain? No, it, you, you say, this is what this neuron does to that other neuron. So in that sense, when interpreting the existing literature, you could benefit from thinking about it in terms of causality. What, does, what do the experiments actually say and what do they not say about causality? Right. But also then when it comes to, say, if you're implicitly building in objectives that the system has, the, thing, the question is, what are the meaningful objectives? What's their causal role? How do they cause behavior in the end? And so in that sense, I think it can, the concept can be usefully implemented in, in, in any model of neural activity. Right. Yeah, it's just so difficult to put lots of the models together, you know, in a way that makes sense for everybody involved. <laughs> this, 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 right. But the concept of causality, that is something, if you ask yourself how you think about intelligent, uh, intelligence, the concept of causality is what makes it intelligence. But I mean, at, at any point in time, I've got neurons that are predicting what's what's going to be happening in my environment right now. You know, that's sort of the brain as a prediction engine sort of idea, right? This right. Uh, and uh, the causality of those predictions being made involve vast amounts of past experience, not just the past second or the past minute, but years, years. <laughs> This, 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 right. And you could, but you could, for example, view the prediction. If you, if you view the prediction engine like that, you can say that the wanting to predict things is the thing that causes the tuning curves in the end. Oh, yeah, I, could, I can see that. Uh, wanting to predict things. Yeah, the, uh, the goal of trying to predict things is what gives rise to how they compute. Well, I see, I'm of the impression that the, the prediction is not a goal, it's just something that happens as a part of the mechanism of the neural network. At least in, in HTM, you know, we have a sequence memory um, theory algorithm, and, and the but, predictions just occur if you connect them to the input the right way. This, this, this right, but the, the way how you set up the connecting them to the input in the right way is such that they change themselves so that they get better at predicting. 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so, it's, so it's, and it's, you have like a little... complicated. It's like the world is topological. So you've got to have these all these localized computations that I mean, it's super complicated. <laughs> but I, I mean, I think I agree with you. I mean, causality is super important and we can't make any assumptions about why we're seeing what we're seeing if we're monitoring neural populations necessarily, unless we know the, if, and we can never look at the internal reality of the system to verify it anyway. So we have to be very careful about the assumptions that we're making, right? That's right. And I, I want to add one more thing. The backpropagation of error algorithm is also just a causal inference algorithm. It tries to figure out which changes in neural properties would make performance be better. Yeah. So, yeah. so even local prediction versus global optimization leads to a very similar logical structure where you have an objective in learning that gives rise to computation. Right. Right. Well, that sounds right to me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Dr. Cording, thanks again for, awesome. for joining us. Be and, great. Uh, thanks for a, having me on. No problem. Talk to cool. you later. Bye. See you.